What's going on everyone? Time to build another PC. This time around though, we'll be showing you step-by-step -step how to do so. So for those who are new to PC builds altogether or who maybe need a refresher, this video will come in very handy. Also, we chose very budget-oriented components. We expect that most newbies out there aren't going to want to splurge on the most expensive hardware for their first PC build. I totally get that. My first PC cost around 600 bucks. That's what we're gonna do in this video, build a PC that costs, well, around 600 bucks. I hope you enjoy. Here starts the tutorial. So a quick run through of the parts, the things you will need to assemble your first PC. Obviously you'll need the components to actually make the PC work properly. You're gonna need CPU, RAM, motherboard, a graphics card. Also gonna need some sort of storage drive, preferably a case, just kind of raw dogging it outside of a case isn't very cool. It doesn't look very cool unless you're throwing it in a desk or something. So I recommend a case and you're going to also need a power supply. You can also get fancy and throw some RGB LEDs in there, extra fans, that's all optional. But to make your PC work, these are the five or six components you will definitely need. Now the one tool you're going to need is a Phillips head screwdriver. This won't be included in any of the boxes from the components you purchased for the PC, so I recommend having one on hand. It's good to have one just in general anyway. A decent sized Phillips head screwdriver. Also, magnetize it if you can. Don't worry, it's not going to fry any of your components. I don't know why crap like that just gets flooded in forums, but you're not going to fry. The magnetic fields in these things are really weak, okay? You just need something strong enough to get those screws out of really tight places if you do happen to drop one or two. A pair of needle nose pliers might be handy to get small things into small spaces as well, and if you do intend on using zip ties or tie straps, scissors, or wire cutters could also also come in handy. All right, let's start taking things out of their boxes and assembling our PC. The first thing you'll want to do is take your motherboard out of its box. You could use the motherboard box as a workstation, so rest it on top of that. You won't worry about scratching anything underneath. If you have maybe a block of wood or something you're not worried about getting scratched because there are pretty fine and sharp soldering points underneath the board, then you could use something along those lines. But I would say the box for the motherboard is preferable under most situations. You'll want to take note of where the DIMM slots are. Those are to the right side of the CPU socket. The CPU socket obviously is in the middle at the top of the board, and then we have our PCIe slots down below. Now remove your CPU from its box. Don't worry, this is not rocket science. Just don't drop the CPU on anything. This is the PGA layout, so the pins are on the CPU itself. You bend any of these and you're gonna have a really bad time. Be mindful of the triangle indicated on the CPU, one of the four corners there. You will want to line this up with the marking on one of the four corners of the motherboard socket. This is basically the orientation of the CPU. It'll only fit one way, so don't force anything. Go ahead and pull up on that metal lever there at the bottom. This will open the socket up. We can rest our CPU gently inside the socket like so. And then once we're sure that it's stationary, we're not pushing anything too hard, then you can take that metal lever again, slide it right back down, and there you go. You've just installed a CPU into your first computer. Now the next thing you want to do is install your DDR3 or 4. We're using Ryzen's of DDR4 it is, and those slots on the right side of the socket are the things we need to be mindful of. I recommend installing RAM first over your CPU cooler because sometimes you might have clearance issues, although we're going to be using the stock Ryzen cooler here, so nothing to worry about. Go ahead and grab your RAM and take note of the notch in each module. Want to line this notch up with the indention inside each dim slot on your motherboard. Our motherboard indicates the optimal RAM insertion pattern. We have two modules, so it does matter to an extent. If we had four modules, it would matter which module we put into which slot. But because it does say that the second furthest slot to the left is the first slot we should be mindful of, we're gonna be mindful of that one. Pull back on the levers on that one. Also, the levers on the furthest right slot, that's where DIMM2 goes. Now, RAM insertion takes a bit of force, okay? I'm just gonna be straightforward with you here. You're not gonna break anything as long as you've aligned that notch with the indention in the slot. First, you'll want to gently slide the module into the slot, just just enough to where you start feeling some pretty intense resistance. Then take two fingers, one on each side of the module, push really hard till one side engages all the way, and then push hard until the other side engages. Then the levers on each side should be up all the way and you've installed a RAM slot. There you go. I probably over explained it, but I don't want you to feel like you're breaking anything. Do the exact same thing, by the way, for the second module. And if you have two more or four more, it doesn't matter. As long as you have enough slots for them, go ahead and repeat the process. Now, CPU cooler installation is entirely subjective. It really depends on the CPU cooler you chose and how long that takes is, again, depending on the product, but we're going to use the stock rising cooler so things shouldn't take, I don't know, maybe a minute or two. We're going to need to remove the two black brackets on top of the back plate on the motherboard. It's just four simple Phillips head screws, and that's it. Now, once that's removed, we want to keep the back plate still in the motherboard, poking through the four holes. Take the CPU cooler, which already has that pre-applied thermal paste, and kind of align it with the holes on the board. There are already screws kind of threaded through the CPU cooler, so just use your Phillips head screwdriver to secure the cooler in place. The last thing here, be sure to install the CPU fan cable to the respective header on the board. It's usually labeled CPU underscore one or along those lines, and it will be close to the CPU socket just conveniently. Uh, now, some motherboards, very few, but some will not even post or allow you 
you to, to boot into your OS unless you have a CPU fan connected to that CPU header. I think an ASUS board I had did that. I thought it was really weird because I'm like, well, what if you're water cooling and you plug your pump in there? That's really all you can do or just like a case fan. But yeah, so just do it just to be safe. If you could plug it into like, uh, I don't know, chassis fan one or something along those lines, but CPU fan header is the one that I would try to plug in first. Someone just looked inside my window. I have it open because why not? And uh, they're wondering what I'm doing in here. All right, so we have our motherboard with the CPU, RAM, and CPU cooler all installed. It's pretty much the bulk of your system, although Ryzen CPUs are not APUs, meaning they don't have integrated graphics processors, so you can't just plug an HDMI cable into your motherboard and say, hey, this PC is going to work now. That's just not how it works. Intel CPUs, equivalent Intel CPUs, do have integrated graphics processors, albeit they're pretty weak, but at least you can get a picture from them. With Ryzen CPUs, you will need discrete graphics. That's just how it is. That's also why the CPUs are so cheap, which is a good thing. You can pretty much grab this bulk of hardware now with the CPU cooler only because it's installed correctly. I'm assuming that it's installed correctly. Double check that before you pick everything up by it. We're gonna use this little handle of sorts here, makeshift handle, to uh, allow us to install our motherboard into our computer case. In this case, I have chosen a P300 from Fantex, a really great budget-oriented case that does come with tempered glass and integrated RGB LEDs. Comes in around 60 bucks or so, and it does support ATX motherboards. Go ahead and lay your case downward with the left side facing upward toward your ceiling. Reach into your motherboard box and pull out that trusty rear IO shield. This thing is a major pain, but it does keep things nice and clean back here. Go ahead and install it with the, you know, the colorful side facing outward toward the back of the case. You don't want this installed backwards or upside down because then your motherboard installation isn't gonna go very well. You're gonna wanna pop this into place with just a lot of force. You just kinda hammer it there. I mean, you're not gonna break an IO shield unless you do something really absurd, but make sure it clicks on all four corners and then we can get to installing the motherboard into the case. Go ahead and use the CPU cooler as makeshift handle and kinda guide it through into where it should be. You can use this standoff right here. Most of the time is like a guide of sorts. If it's threading through this hole, then you've pretty much got it where it should be. Also, you can use the rear I.O. openings as guides to, you know, double check that everything is where it should be. Now use these screws that should have been included with your case to secure the motherboard. You might need eight, you might need nine if you have a full size ATX board. It really depends. That middle standoff there might not be threaded. In this case it is, so we're going to use nine screws in total. You can slid on this time lapse, by the way, if you want a better indication of where each of these holes on the board is, where the screw should be going. There should be three at the bottom, either two or three running right through the middle, and then three up top. At this point, go ahead and set your case on its feet. I recommend doing the meticulous wire now because installing the power supply can make things a bit more funky later on because there's gonna be so many cables running through the back side of the case. So your front IO connectors, you'll have like maybe a power switch, power LED, hard drive LED, and a reset switch. You'll want to install those very first because those are the smallest cables. If you check out my cable management guide here, I talk about how I like to cable manage my PCs. I start with the smallest cables first and then I use the thickest ones at the end to kind of smush those thinner cables against the case and keep things nice and tidy. All right, now I've got my trusty whiteboard here to help better explain the front IO connection process. This tends to be a place where people get tripped up. If you miswire this, you might not have a PC that boots up at all, especially if you plan on using the power button itself as a physical means to turn the PC on rather than jumping it with, I don't know, like a Phillips head screwdriver or something, which I'll talk about in a second. So find the place on the board indicated JFP1. That's usually what it's labeled as. You're going to have kind of a box that looks like this somewhere on the bottom of your board and you'll have one, two, three, four pins on the top and one, two, three, four, five pins on the bottom. There shouldn't be a pin in this location. Now, typically the uppermost left pins here are for power LEDs. These are usually disconnected cables. They're not conjoined like the power switch is. And be mindful, of course, of the positive and negative polarities here. Your motherboard will tell you which is which. It's not gonna matter really for your power switch because it's just, you know, you're just completing a circuit. But here, polarity does matter. Uh, so I recommend checking your manual. Look for something like JFP1 in your manual double check that that this array is the same as what I'm showing you because this should be more or less a refresher not a rule of thumb for every motherboard out there again power switch should be here you don't have to worry about polarity but you know just do it the way they tell you to anyway uh, these two will typically be for your hard drive LED it'll typically be labeled like HDD LED and then these two are for your reset switch. Again, this is just a completion circuit, so there's no polarity to be mindful of here, although it's typically labeled positive negative. Actually, in some cases, it's negative positive. I don't know why, it doesn't matter, like I said, but the LED ones do matter. And in our P300 case, we only have to worry about the power switch 
and the hard drive LED. Make sure you've aligned this one correctly and that this one is installed in the correct two pins. There's no pin over here, remember, so that's kind of your rule of thumb and you should be all right. All right, that was probably the most difficult part of PC building there, just the very small cables to get right. Uh, if you have HD audio coming from your front panel, make sure to connect that to your motherboard as well. That's typically on the bottom left side of the motherboard. Uh, be mindful of the USB 2.0, this is all listed in the manual and the pins are all labeled, uh, typically they're labeled in the cases from the front IO. And then we also have USB 3.0 to be mindful of. Those are the blue uh, tipped headers. And again, it's like, you know, it's like a puzzle. It just, it fits where it fits and you'll know where USB 3.0 is because it's the only place where that cable will go. All right, now that the small wiring is done, let's go ahead and install our solid state and or hard disk drives. This is just a preferential thing. You could run the operating system on either. If you wanna run a, a hard drive config along with an SSD config, maybe have your boot drive on the SSD and like general storage on the hard drive. That's pretty cool. You get a lot of storage for cheap with a hard drive, although it's not the quietest and the SSD gives you the really fast boot times. Here, I've only chosen a single 240 gig SSD from PNY's Accelerate brand. It's still a really great uh, SSD. It's not a lot of storage, but it's going to be super snappy. And if you're only looking to play a few games, this should be sufficient. Next, to grab a SATA cable. It'll look something like this and connect it to your drive of choice. If you have more than one drive, you'll need more than one SATA cable. Your motherboard should include at least a few of these. And then connect the other ends of each into your motherboard into headers that look like this. They should snap into place so you'll know when they're properly installed. Now, at this point, you might be wondering why I haven't yet installed my power supply. It's just how I do things. It keeps the cable management, like I said, a bit easier for me. It's just a personal preference really though. You could install your graphics card at this point or you could install the power supply just to keep you from getting really impatient. Let's go ahead and install the power supply now and then we'll deal with the graphics card last. In this case, we've got a V650 from Cooler Master. It is a fully modular power supply with black sleeve cables and it is 80 plus gold rated. So 650 watts is actually severe overkill for the system. This system is gonna be utilizing just the bare bones amount of power here. I'd say maybe around 150 to 200 watts peak and that's because the graphics card we chose is the GTX 1050 which doesn't even need a dedicated VGA power cable. Go ahead and install the modular cables you will need. You'll definitely need a 24 pin, either a four or eight pin EPS cable. That's for the CPU power at the top left of your motherboard. You may need a VGA cable or two. It's a six or eight pin cable or both, depending on the graphics card you chose. But we went with the GTX 1050, which requires no dedicated VGA power cable at all. In fact, we're gonna be running this entire card off of just the 75 watts or so delivered from the PCIe slot on the board. Also be mindful of how many SATA connections you'll need and any Molex connections if those are in your case. Some older hardware will typically use Molex, but for the most part, SATA will be all you need. I think in this case, we only needed two or three SATA connections for our one SSD and one for our integrated case lighting. Uh, that is just a cable that runs directly from the front IO of the P300. And that's it. Now, I recommend having a few extra SATA connections just kind of laying around not being used in case you do want to install an extra drive or two later on. It means that you won't have to pull your power supply completely out of your system to install an extra set of SATA power connections for the future. The last two things we need to power are our motherboard via the 24 pin and our C CPU via the 8-pin EPS port up top. Our graphics card, remember, does not have a dedicated VGA power port, so we don't have a six or eight pin on the board itself. It's all being powered through the PCIe slot. So go ahead and grab first the eight pin EPS cable. It's that long one with eight pins on it. Go ahead and run that up the right side of the case, thread it through the hole, and then when you turn the case around, looking at it from the left side of the panel, the top left side of the motherboard will have either a four or eight pin port there. Connect that cable to that port. That's a, a basically CPU power is what that's for. It's dedicated CPU power. If you don't have that connected, your CPU you won't post or it might post but it won't do anything the last thing for us the 24 pin it's pretty straightforward just make sure you align the indention on the port itself with the little thread and the clip on the 24 pin cable now at this point because all power cables are connected i recommend cable managing do your best to kind of make things look clean back here okay if you ever need to go back into the right side of your case you want it to look clean and presentable because then you know where everything is you know where to put everything back and you don't have to worry about kind of smushing that right side panel on we all know how that is or thus we've been doing this a while you have a really crappy case with crappy cable management space on the right side, it can be it can be a real pain to have to get that right side panel back into position. Now at this point, we need to install the graphics card and that's it, we're finished with the PC build. This is a pretty straightforward process, but you might be wondering why there's no PCI slot brackets or frames at the back of this case. It's because I installed a Cooler Master vertical graphics card mount here before, prior, and I had to cut through the case. So it's gonna look a bit weird, first off, to have a really small card mounted horizontally. Uh, this, this is gonna cost a bit more if you wanna orient the card vertically, 
we're about to do. It's about 50 bucks or so with the riser cable included from Cooler Master. It's all linked in the video description, by the way, uh, but that's why I'm doing this because the card is so small and it looks a bit weird to have an ATX case with a really, really small form factor graphics card. If you want to install your graphics card horizontally, don't worry, it's pretty conventional. In fact, most people do that and it eliminates the risk of having a really crappy riser cable cut into your frame rate or not allow your PC to post at all. Uh, so it's a safer bet, but if you want the aesthetic look, you can go with the vertical mount. But for the horizontal mount, all you need to do is push back on the lever on the right side of the uppermost 16 lane slot, kind of push it into the motherboard a bit, it'll kind of click, then you'll know it's pushed all the way back. Clear out the two slot covers on the right side of the case that align with that slot, that 16 lane slot on the board, and then slide the card into place. It should snap back, there you go. Take the two thumb screws in the back of the case, secure it upright, and you've installed a graphics card. If you had a six or eight pin or a two six pins or two eight pins or whatever connected to the graphics card, use those VGA power connections on the power supply to power the card. It's actually supplemental power, but this card doesn't need it because it's a really weak card. Now, if you want to install your graphics card vertically with the Cooler Master Kit, I have a tutorial right here. Pretty straightforward. It shouldn't take you but five or six minutes to do. You just need a pair of wire cutters to cut through those PCIe frames there at the back of the case. I'm kind of showing you a time lapse now of the process I had to go through after after the cutting, which I had done way in advance. And uh, here you go, here's the final result, what it all looks like when it's said and done and put together. Now for the final test, we're gonna connect our PC to a monitor and see if it posts. Make sure you connect the HDMI cable or the DisplayPort cable, whatever cable you're using, to the graphics card in a build like this, not into the motherboard. Those HDMI ports and whatnot on the motherboard for Ryzen CPUs are for the APUs, which Ryzen CPUs by convention are not. They don't have integrated chips, remember, for graphics. So we need to plug them into our graphics card to get a signal to our monitor. Once that's connected and the monitor's powered, go ahead and plug in the power cable that came with your power supply into the back of your PC and into a wall outlet, preferably via a surge protector just to be safe. And then flick the switch on the back of the power supply into the on position, and then click the power button at the front of your PC. You should get some fans turning. If you have installed LEDs and whatnot, then you should see some lights. And uh, hopefully your PC is working the way it should and you get a post to your monitor. Usually it'll indicate your motherboard manufacturer and ask if you wanna go into your BIOS or if you want to boot from a particular drive. In this case, we only have one drive, so it's gonna try to boot from that until we install an operating system to that drive, though it's just gonna keep boot looping. Now at this point, step back from the screen and look at your computer. You built that thing, that's your baby. You brought it to life, it's breathing now. You can see it responds on screen. It's like it's talking to you. And you know, just, just admire it. Just take a step back and say, yeah, I built that. Feels good to do things by hand, right? Well, ladies and gentlemen, I hope for those of you who are new out there, this video just amped you up, made you wanna build a PC that much more because now you see how easy it is, right? You can say, I built my computer and that sounds really complicated and makes you sound super smart, but in reality, it's a really simple process. And that's kind of why I jumped on this bandwagon a while back and said, I'm gonna do this for a living. I really like building PCs, it's really fun. Uh, and it's really simple too. Now, the custom loops and stuff, it gets a bit more complicated. This thing back here was not the easiest thing to build, but a simple air-cooled PC with six or seven components will take you maybe three or four hours if you're a, a new timer. Uh, I would say that you could probably knock that down to about an hour if you've been doing this multiple times. And I will warn you right now, it is an addicting process. If you like this video, be sure to give this one a thumbs up. I appreciate that. Be sure to give it a thumbs down if you feel the complete opposite or you hate everything about life, I guess. I'll go ahead and throw that in there. Be sure to click that red subscribe button down below if you have not already and the bell notification icon so you can get notified when videos like these go live. This is Science Studio. Check out all the parts of this build in the video description. Thanks for learning with us.